For many people, this is the stereotypical image associated with the word meditation. This is what I found searching on a generic video archive with the search query, meditation. Tons of videos of people sitting there, cross-legged in lotus position, eyes closed, serenely meditating. Meditation has become one of the most well-known and most popular elements of Buddhism in the modern world. Today, it's practiced in schools and Fortune 500 companies, yoga studios and prisons, science labs and protests, and has even been embraced by by Barbie. Perhaps you've even tried to meditate yourself. I've tried and I'm bad at it. But as meditation practices grow more popular and move into non-religious spaces, it raises the question of where these practices came from and what they meant in their original context. As we'll see, the popular conception of meditation as a practice of clearing one's mind in order to relax or deal with stress is quite different from how early Buddhist texts understood meditation. In this video, we'll examine meditation in some early Buddhist texts and compare meditation as it's often understood today with the picture that we get from early Buddhism. First, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a daily newsletter that gets you up to speed on business, finance, and tech news. Best of all, it's free and it's delivered to your inbox daily. So my mornings are my most efficient time of day. It's when I hunker down and do the most research for this channel. It's when I do the most video editing, but I'm also a heavy news consumer. So I'm always at risk to find myself locked in a morning news spiral. So aimlessly scrolling through headlines, being sucked into YouTube news commentary, that's being fed to me by the algorithm. It's really not the most efficient use of my time, but Morning Brew is the complete opposite. It's witty, it's relevant, it's concise, so you can get up to speed about business, finance, and tech in under five minutes. So for example, as a YouTuber, I like to keep up to date on what the social media platforms are up to, so I can roll with any algorithmic punches that they throw my way. And in today's Morning Brew, I learned why Meta stock price tanked last week, and how Apple and Google's privacy updates are upending the digital ad industry, all in one informative newsletter. So if you're interested in business, finance, or tech news, then check out Morning Brew. You can subscribe by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks, everyone. Back to the show. To start, let's address some misconceptions we might be bringing to the table. The first misconception, the big one, is the idea that all Buddhists meditate. This is a common assumption, that what it means to be a Buddhist is to meditate. And that is just historically not the case. For most of the history of Buddhism, until maybe the last 100 years, meditation was considered to be a difficult, advanced practice, taken up by only a few people. Most people did not have the time, training, or inclination to practice meditation. As I mentioned in a previous video in the series, most Buddhists engaged in everyday practices of ritual, donating food or money to monks or nuns, and trying to accumulate merit and good karma in order to secure a good rebirth. Meditation was honored as a religious practice that would lead to awakening, but most people did not attempt it themselves. The second misconception is that meditation involves sitting silently, trying to clear your mind and make it empty. But as we'll soon see, meditation was often not a silent practice. There are certain forms of meditation that involve being silent and examining your own mind, but there are also other forms of meditation that involve chanting a text in a group. Likewise, meditation was not about trying to clear your mind of all thoughts. Instead, a lot of Buddhist meditation is discursive. That is, it follows a kind of script, saying this is step one, now go to step two, now go to step three, and at each step you're doing a particular thing with your mind. Often you're meditating on a particular doctrine, trying to develop a deeper personal understanding of it. And the final misconception is that the term meditation refers to one thing. There are actually many, many forms of Buddhist meditation, and we are going to barely scratch the surface with this video. Some are what we might call formal meditation, in which people are explicitly aware that they're engaging in meditative practice. But there are also plenty of forms of what we might call informal meditation. Picture, for example, a Zen monk tending to a Zen garden, or a Tibetan woman swinging a prayer wheel while walking around a stupa, a pure land Buddhist visualizing Amitabha's Pure Land, or a Nichiren Buddhist chanting the Lotus Sutra mantra, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. We can think of these as forms of meditation that cultivate particular mental states. Now that we've addressed some of these popular misconceptions, let's look now at the role meditation plays in Buddhism. What did these practices aim to do? Why do Buddhists meditate? 
One reason why Buddhists practice meditation is simply that it arose in a cultural and historical context in which meditation was already practiced. Meditation seems to be an Indian tradition that goes back long before the time of the Buddha. Remember in the story of the life of the Buddha, one of the four sights that convinces Siddhartha Gautama to seek a solution to suffering was witnessing someone in meditation. So the earliest Buddhist texts already presuppose that these practices predate the Buddha, which must have included both Hindu and Jain meditation traditions. There's even tantalizing evidence of the possibility that meditation goes back to the time of the Indus Valley Civilization in the 3rd millennium BCE. This seal, known as the Pashupati seal, is thought to date somewhere between 2300 and 2000 BCE and may depict someone engaging in meditation practice. Scholars still don't know how to translate the language of these seals, so we're not sure what this image signifies, but in any case, scholars suspect that the idea idea of training the mind and body in order to solve the human problem of samsara is a technique that predates Buddhism by thousands of years. However, this technique became very important in Buddhism. The Buddha is said to have reached realization of the nature of reality and consequently enlightenment while deep in meditation under the Bodhi tree. The Buddha taught that any of his followers who wished to attain enlightenment themselves should practice meditation, and he gave detailed instructions for how to do it in texts such as the Satipatthana Sutta, which we'll examine shortly. Later Buddhists elaborated on the Buddha's teachings and developed sophisticated theories of meditation, meditation manuals, and practices of meditation. So even though we should note that most Buddhists in history have not practiced meditation themselves, it retained a central place at the highest levels of Buddhist thought and practice. But still, this does not explain what meditation is. What was the Buddhist account of how meditation can lead to awakening? One way to explore what meditation is, is to look at the word itself. When we say meditation, we're using an English word to translate a Sanskrit or Pali word, bhavana. And so it's useful to look at both sides of that translation. The English word meditation actually comes from a Latin root meditatio, which is a practice that Christian monks did. It literally just means thinking over something. So this process of deeply considering certain ideas in order to develop a deep understanding of them is practiced in many religious traditions, including Christianity. But meditation is not necessarily the best translation for the Sanskrit term. It's just the one that historically has happened to be the most common translation. Translation. So let's look at the actual Pali or Sanskrit words translated as meditation. Well, there are several in fact. Most often the root word is bhavana, although you'll see yoga sometimes or dhyana or jhana translated as meditation too. But let's focus on bhavana. It comes from the verb meaning to be. By adding ana, the word now implies causation. So the term literally means something like causing to be. That's a little clunky, but some scholars suggest cultivation is an apt translation too. This term cultivation indicates that meditation is not just thinking about stuff. Instead, it's about bringing something into being, whether that's cultivating certain states of mind or cultivating a deep understanding of Buddhist teachings. Because it's one thing to hear a Buddhist idea, but another thing entirely to understand it intellectually. And it's yet another thing to develop a deep and personal understanding of this idea. Meditation is about realizing Buddhist ideas deep down. Let's use a sports metaphor. Let's say you're learning how to play basketball. The coach can explain to you how to dribble, how to play defense, how to shoot a three-pointer. Intellectually, you know how to do all of these things. But let's say after the coach explains it to you, you then go out onto the court and try it for yourself. What's gonna happen? Nothing. You're gonna suck at basketball because it's not the sort of thing that you can just understand intellectually. You can't just explain to someone how to make a layup. It involves practice to be good at it. To know how to play it, you have to practice it. You have to get a feel for it yourself, and eventually, your body learns to make the motions without requiring any abstract or step-by-step -step cognitive process. It becomes muscle memory. It becomes innate. Meditation is like that, but for the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha says that for a person to attain awakening, they can't just understand what he did. They need to understand it for themselves, and not just on an intellectual level, but deeply. And to really deeply understand it, the Buddha said that people need to practice it or to cultivate it. And meditation is how you do that. It's how you cultivate deep understanding of Buddhist ideas. But how does meditation help in cultivating deep realization? To understand this, it's helpful to break down how meditation is conceptualized in Buddhist texts. In general, we can think of meditation as having two broad overlapping components. They are samatha, concentration meditation, 
and vipassana, insight meditation. To quote a Buddhist saying, these two aspects are like two wheels of a cart or the two wings of Buddhist meditation. In order to fly, a bird needs two wings, and in order to meditate, meditators need both samatha and vipassana. The point of samatha, or concentration meditation, is developing the ability to focus on one single object for a long time without being distracted. Most people's minds are constantly jumping from thing to thing to thing, unable to settle on any one topic. We can think of our minds as being kind of like a turbulent pool of water, brown and muddy, all mixed up with dirt. You can't see anything because it's so muddy and shaken up all the time. Concentration or calming meditation helps settle that. If you've ever shaken up a bottle of water with debris in it, once you stop it from moving, the debris settles down to the bottom and then you have clear water. So in concentration meditation, the goal is to make your minds clear like that water. Because once it's clear and it's still, you can see through to the bottom. Underlying this practice is an understanding that the mind is fundamentally clear and pure. It's usually muddied up by hatred, greed, and delusion. Concentration meditation is meant to calm the mind so that you can reclaim control of the mind and focus on the things we want to focus on. In traditional forms of samatha meditation, meditators focus on certain objects of contemplation. So you're not clearing the mind by thinking about nothing, you're thinking of particular things. Buddhist texts like the Visuddhimagga list 40 meditation objects, including colored shapes, the body, or the breath, but also positive mental qualities such as compassion or equanimity. According to Buddhist meditation theory, once the meditator learns to calm the mind, they can enter into deep states of concentration, known as dhyanas in Sanskrit or jhanas in Pali. It'd take many more videos to explore this deeply, but very briefly, Buddhist meditation theory maps out levels of dhyanas and the qualities associated with each one. Within that concentrated mental state, meditators can then undertake vipassana, or insight meditation. In this kind of meditation, meditators pursue an analysis of a particular object or idea in order to develop deep wisdom. For example, the meditator might be trying to develop deep insight into Buddhist doctrines like impermanence, dissatisfaction, and not-self. In each case, the meditator is developing insight into the nature of reality, and to understand these things not just on an intellectual level, but deeply in their own experience. Another key concept in early Buddhist meditation theory is mindfulness. This concept is often talked about in a kind of loose way these days, mindfulness as a sort of baseline awareness of the present moment, and while that captures certain aspects of mindfulness, it can also be misleading. To start, we should say that mindfulness is supposed to be a quality of mind that you can bring to all forms of Buddhist meditation, as well as, ideally, to the rest of life. Mindfulness is regarded both by scholars and practitioners as essential not only for the development of insight, Insight, but also for the cultivation and maintenance of ethical discipline. The term mindfulness literally translates the word smirti in Sanskrit or sati in Pali, but this literal translation is misleading if not properly understood. A broader understanding of mindfulness in the early Buddhist tradition involves two interrelated mental processes. The English term mindfulness mixes what is regarded in Buddhist philosophy of mind as two cognitive functions. On one hand, sati or smirti, which we might translate as attention, and sampanyana or samprajanya, which I'll translate here as introspective vigilance. Let's focus on the first. Attention, which involves fixating your attention on an object. So sometimes we're absent-minded or careless. Oftentimes we're drawn here and there by all sorts of little different things, which can make you unable to focus. Attention is the opposite of that. It brings you back to what is actually happening. The second is introspective vigilance, the careful maintenance of that attention and of the attitudes and motivations that come along with it. You're carefully monitoring your own body and mind to see what is happening. And so, mindfulness in a Buddhist sense consists of focusing attention on an object, but also careful monitoring of one's internal states. One way to bring all of this together is to look at the Satipatthana Sutta, known in English as Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta. This is one of the earliest and most important Buddhist texts about meditation. It's available for free at a link in the description below, and is believed by Buddhists to be taught by the Buddha himself. It opens with the Buddha claiming that the cultivation of mindfulness is part of the path to awakening, Nirvana. This text leads the audience through a meditation meant to cultivate mindfulness, and it does this by leading people through an examination of four parts of your body and mind. Your physical body, 
feelings, moods, and dharma or dhamma, which we'll translate here as objects of awareness. The text begins by focusing on the body and saying that it will focus on body as body. In order to do this, it gives the instruction that meditators should go to a quiet place, sit in lotus position, and then you focus on the breath, understanding when you're breathing in, when you're breathing out. Then he directs people to analyze the different parts of the body. The text says, a monk reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bone, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, urine. Quite an exhaustive list, but it makes the meditator realize that this thing that we often take to be a whole, our body, is actually made up of many smaller parts. Next, the meditator is instructed to look at dead bodies or decomposing bodies, which is unsettling to say the least. And the goal of this practice is to get people to realize that this body that all of us are so attached to and which leads us to behave in selfish ways is impermanent and is going to die. The text then continues leading meditators through similar processes of contemplation focused on mind, feelings, and other objects of awareness. For example, the text says, when feeling a painful feeling, the monk discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling. When feeling a pleasant feeling, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling. The Buddha ends the text by reiterating that these practices can lead to awakening by cultivating deep understanding of the Buddha's teachings. This is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding. So after going through this broad overview of early Buddhist theories of meditation and mindfulness, you may have noticed that this version of meditation is quite different than meditation as it's commonly described today. For instance, today meditation is often something practiced in a non-religious context for relaxation or to promote mental health and productivity. It's open and accessible to anyone, and you can even learn it from an app. Meditators are told to clear their minds and live in the present. By contrast, meditation as it's described in this early Buddhist text was practiced for what we might call a religious goal, attaining enlightenment or liberation from suffering. Instead of being relaxing, it could potentially be downright stressful, as when Buddhist meditators are told to contemplate their own mortality or look at decomposing bodies. Moreover, it was practiced by relatively few people and was considered an advanced practice that required training and supervision by an experienced master. And it often followed step-by-step -step instructions meant to cultivate deep understanding of specific Buddhist teaching. What's more, Buddhist meditation was always done in the context of a broad broader ethical system. The monks and nuns who formed the majority of meditators took strict vows, and the goal was always to overcome negative mental states and free people from suffering. The growth of meditation outside of the monks and nuns is a relatively recent development. For example, the foundations of mindfulness was popularized in the 20th century by figures like the Burmese monk Mahasi Sayadaw, as well as the Burmese teacher Sayagi Ubakin and his students, who later set up a bunch of meditation centers after his death. Both figures were important in bringing bringing vipassana practice in particular to the United States. This is not to say that modern practices of meditation are not legitimate. Religions are always evolving, and they change as they enter new places. And we as historians of religion are not here to say that one or another form of meditation is more or less authentic, more or less Buddhist than any other. Instead, our job as historians is to try to understand the past on its own terms and appreciate the ways that practices of meditation have transformed over time. Meditation, like prayer, worship, or charity, is a technique that has been used in many ways across different time periods, cultural locations, and religious traditions. In Buddhism, it's often used to cultivate deep realization of the Buddhist teachings, whereas in modern contexts, it may be used for the purpose of relaxation after a busy day. The point is that the same technique may be used for different purposes by different people or traditions. The meaning of these practices is determined not by the practice itself, but by the context of the use. Therefore, if we want to 
to understand a technique like meditation, we need to look carefully at the particular context of practice and interpretation where it's given meaning. Because as those contexts change, so does the meaning of the technique itself.